Hi guys, it's Nurse Howie. Welcome back. Sorry it's been so long, but I've come up with a new lesson for you, and it's all about propofol. To monitor his EKG, we have to monitor his n vital CO2. We have to make sure that he's breathing. We have to see his saturation. We have to make sure he's ventilating. So these are all. That's all typical stuff. That's you can use these standard medications. of care. Yes. Okay, so the propofol. Still burning. Okay. Ten. Nine, eight, four, three, two, one. And once again, if you haven't subscribed already, please subscribe to Nurse Howie. <laughs> That's my assistant slash fiance in the background. But so we're going to be talking about propofol IV. And many of us know about propofol and its part in aiding the pop singer Michael Jackson's death, unfortunately. I was a huge fan of Michael Jackson. Loved the guy, everything about him. He was such a wonderful performer. But unfortunately, he succumbed to uh, overuse and abuse of propofol drugs. So it is a very dangerous drug, but it is highly, highly useful in modern medicine, especially in intensive care unit. But it's used since the 80s, gives much value to the ICU and the surgical patient population. It keeps patients asleep so they don't experience the painful parts of a procedure or hospitalization. So what is it? Propofol is a potent intravenous sedative hypnotic drug used to induce and maintain anesthesia for sedation in intensive care units and sometimes in operating rooms. What's in it? Emulsion containing soybean oil, glycerol, egg lecithin. In addition, either editate disodium EDTA or sodium meta metabisulfite, it's hard to say, has been added as a preservative. That's also right me if you see them. So check your patients to see if they have two things. One, egg or soybean allergies. Sulfate may also cause reactions. Or two, have hyperlipidemia. Most cardiac patients do. Then see if it's uncontrolled. And then you can probably still give it, but stay on top of it by monitoring labs. Now, what does it look like? I'm gonna show you a video of what it looks like. Okay, so the propofol. We're gonna start infusing this. You're gonna get a little sleepy. Basically, it looks like milk. All these lipids are what propofol binds to, not water. So this soybean oil, egg, and glycerol together look like milk. And if you guessed that it is sticky, you are correct. I've broken a couple bottles myself and it landed on the floor and every time I step on it, it's very, very sticky. So that's why it's called the milk of amnesia. Well, I don't know that anyone calls it that, but they just usually say propofol or the brand name Diprovan, or better yet, they just shorten it to prop. Now, how long does it take to leave the body? Pharmacokinesis. Well, clearance of propofol is 1.5 to 2.2 liters per minute. It is rapidly conjugated to molecules glucuronide and sulfate. You don't need to know that, but just know that they are excreted by the kidneys as inactive compounds. But how does it work? All right, now we're going to pharmacodynamics. Mechanism of action is to facilitate inhibitory transmission by directly activating the postsynaptic GABA-A receptor chloride ionophore complex, increasing chloride conductance. Here's what's so great about propofol. Although it differs for some people how quickly it works, I've seen it work in less than a minute and up to five minutes, but probe's claim to fame is that all patients are expected to wake up within 15 minutes that's within 15 minutes of discontinuing the drug, no matter how long you've been using the drug. Now that's amazing. But keep in mind that propofol does not really produce amnesia, especially at lower doses, but it also does not trigger malignant hyperthermia, which is the enemy of CRNAs everywhere, which are certified registered nurse anesthetists. Um, it is also well known, or should be, that propofol decreases systolic and diastolic blood pressures and MAP, which is a mean arterial pressure, by 25 to 40%. That's huge. So definitely, definitely check your blood sugar, uh, your blood pressure of your patients. Now that's almost a quarter to a half. So most of our ICU patients are already compromised in their airway as well as their cardiac status. So in addition, we place them attached to respiratory ventilators that push air down into their lungs, increasingly placing pressure onto the heart, thereby making it weaker. So although the ventilators add pressure, 
The BP side effects from probe are actually due to its vasodilation properties. The sedative decreases sympathetic activity and a direct effect on intracellular smooth muscle, calcium flux or mediated by nitric oxide release via the vascular endothelium. So you'll be happy to know though that at the usual clinical dosages, do you remember them? I'll leave a hint, Prop propofol doesn't cause myocardial depression. So many of our ICU patients have heart failure and this could give you some peace of mind. But all that being said, however, is that I hope you don't forget that propofol is extremely, extremely dangerous when given to patients not on a respiratory ventilator. So that's because it strongly suppresses a person's respiratory drive and its upper airway protective reflexes. So even when you're asleep, you have reflexes that make you breathe while you're unconscious. Well, propofol turns that off. So extra ingredients. For all the chemists and pharmacists out there, a test to see if EDTA um, would affect patients. Well, it doesn't seem to with regards to calcium or sodium, but nor magnesium metabolization. But the sample size only consisted of 122 people for the study, so take that with a grain of salt, no pun intended. But propofol's hydroxyl group enacts an antioxidant activity by scavenging free radicals. Bonus, I mean like they use electron spin resonance spectroscopy, so you know that it's legit. And you know how spectroscopy is, reading a spectroscopy is like a nightmare for me because it just reminds me of organic chemistry all over again. But the therapeutic indications, this is the meat and potatoes of the lecture, is that here's propofol's claim to fame again. Once again, let's mention that patients should wake up within 10 to 15 minutes, irrespective of how long they've been sedated with propofol. So it is also shown that patients have an easier time waking up and weaning off the ventilator versus patients that were sedated using benzodiazepines, um, like the other ultra popular um, midazolam, versed, and fentanyl combination. So let's talk about asthma and COPD and propofol's role in that. So some studies say, show that propofol inhibits tracheal contractions, and unfortunately it has also been tested on dogs, where they found, I'm sorry, Ray, where they found that the drug increases airway diameter despite atropine intake. So it seems that propofol's bronchodilating actions were mediated via anticholinergic effects. Now that's by the main study that I've researched, um, specifically by Merrick, and I'll leave the re references at the end of the lecture for you. Uh, propofol is also superior to lowering respiratory resistance during intubation compared to thiopental and the commonly used automidate. So bronchospasm occurring with propofol is rare but not impossible. So researchers think that it may be due to the egg leptin in the formulation. So maybe later I'll make a video about choosing the right type of sedative for intubation. So severe sepsis. We see it all the time, especially in the COVID pandemic. Um, and definitely, especially in the ICU. So people are still debating the terminology for sepsis and severe sepsis, but regardless, the death rate is still 30%. Uh, so people are still debating the terminology for sepsis and severe sepsis. Regardless, the death is still 30%, death rate. That's huge. So how can propofol help increase patient chances under such dire circumstances? Well, propofol might have a tendency to release constitutive constitutive, that's really hard, nitric oxide synthase, NOS, which may help with various inflammatory mediators induced by sepsis. So these include the famous IL-1, uh, TNF-alpha, interferon gamma, and platelet activating factor, PAF. Although the reactions are complex, basically propofol may relax vascular smooth muscle, subsequently dilating blood vessels, which is good for late sepsis when cardiac output is lower and systemic vascular resistance, SVR, is higher. Basically, propofol appears to be a selective INOS inhibitor and may therefore have particular appeal in patients with sepsis. So definitely, definitely a good thing for that. Um, propofol in head trauma brain injury patients. Uh, so while I'm now more of a MICU, SICU nurse, I was initially trained in neuro ICU. Many, if not all, serious head injury patients are transferred to the ICU for close monitoring and neurologic stabilization. Now, propofol may help with sedating these patients, but also has properties that could aid their healing progress. So these include decreases in intracranial pressure, uh, potentiation of gamma aminergic inhibition and, inhib and inhibition of NMDA glutamate receptors, and voltage-dependent calcium channels and prevention of lipid peroxidation. 
To repeat, PROPE decreases ICP in patients with normal or increased head pressure. So it can also reduce cerebral metabolic rate by almost half, depending on the dose. This neuroprotective effect may be mediated by GABA-A stimulation. Now, status epilepticus. As a veteran myself, I know how important it is to research the vulnerable veteran population. Um, a Veterans Administration cooperative trial in co-op with SFEMS found that lorazepam, 0.1 mg per kg, is the best drug to stop status ellipticus. Now that's very important, but let me tell you a story from when I was a new travel nurse. Now I had a patient that was a well-known epileptic patient. This patient was in the ICU because his seizures returned and with a vengeance. It was probably because of his failing heart and recent mild stroke. So all these exacerbated his seizure symptoms and to top it off, he couldn't speak because he was ventilated in trach. So, well, one night when I was working night shift, I heard that EKG alarms and saw that my patient was showing VTAC runs, but I know that he wasn't really susceptible to these rhythms, at least not lately, and his electrolytes were finally stabilized. So I went to go see how my patient was doing, and even before I came into the room, I could see that he was visibly shaking. I gave him a Valium PRN, but, but the dose didn't work, so he was refractory to it. And he was already receiving Kepra IV, so I gave the in-house night hospitalist a call. So this doctor said, when I asked him, Doc, isn't there anything else that we can give him? Uh, he basically said, I'm sorry, but there's nothing else we could do. And I accepted that. And I feel very ashamed about it because I didn't know that we could also sedate them with propofol. <clears throat> I wish I had known. Otherwise, I would have fought more for the patient. So luckily, he survived the shift. But... Um, learn from my mistakes and maybe it's something that you can use to advocate for your patient um, next time you have a patient that's very refractory to uh, seizure, normal seizure treatment protocols. So uh, nowadays, besides diazepam, uh, continuous IV of propofol or midazolam is a preferred mode of treatment, especially since studies show that uh, SE becomes harder to stop the longer it goes on. Sorry, status epilepticus becomes harder to stop. Now, remember when we talked about the GABA energic neutral protective properties of propofol earlier in the head injury section? Well, it might also assist in patients with status epilepticus and seizures. So, wondering if propofol versus Versed is better? Well, then remember that prop also has antioxidant properties. So, it has an ability to quickly suppress breakthrough seizures. So, this last claim was vented by three studies. Um, I believe they were uh, random, randomized control studies, but... Um, don't take my word for that, but I know there were three studies. They were backed up by three studies. And dosing recommendations including a loading dose of 3 to 5 milligrams per kilogram followed by an infusion of 30 to 100 micrograms per kilogram per minute titrated to EEG seizure suppression. So after 12 hours, the dose is titrated down 50% over the next 12 hours and then off over the next 12 hours after that. Again, that was definitely a claim I'll put in by Merrick and I'll put his re reference to the paper below. Let's see. If seizures should recur, a further loading dose of one to three mg per kilogram, about half of the first loading dose, should be given followed by an infusion, titrated down 50% for 12 hours until you finally reach a seizure-free period. So once again, it is a dosing recommendation of a loading dose of three to five mg per kg followed by an infusion of 30 to 100 micrograms per kilogram per minute, titrated, which is a usual dose, for most hospitals. Some may or may not include the kilogram or the weight-based dosing. Uh, to EEG seizure suppression. So after 12 hours, then you titrate it down by half. And in the next 12 hours, which is the next shift, then they'll titrate it down by half of that, and then half of that, and then half of that, um, until no more seizures recur. If it does recur, then you just start from the beginning. Now, severe delirium tremens, although relatively low in occurrence, about 15%, Delirium tremens is an uncontrollable shaking that some patients experience in the most severe, and it is the most severe symptom of alcoholic withdrawal. Uh, quote unquote, chronic alcohol use uh, causes upregulation of the NMDA glutamate receptor and downregulation of GABA receptors. This may explain why some patients fail to respond to benzodiazepines, which act only on the GABA receptors. Um, again, uh, vented by Merrick. So we still use benzodiazepines as key therapy for alcoholic withdrawal, but drugs such as beta blockers, clonidine, carbamazepine have been shown to be useful as adjunctive therapy, withdrawal refractory to standard therapy propofol. 
However, propofol has time and again been proven to have less adverse effects than benzodiazepines when it comes to delirium tremens. So it also has a more rapid metabolic clearance. And as you know, we prefer propofol sedation to benzodiazepines, especially in the ICU. So yet we still hear about patients' resistance to propofol, even as we reach doses above 75 micrograms per kilogram per minute. So some nurses still use midazolam, which is first said, in conjunction with fentanyl as an alternative or a supplement, um, personal experience, to propofol. That's bad because you're using a lot of sedation. So hopefully you're not doing it for too long and we'll talk more about that. So though if your patient requires three types of drips, this is not a good sign. But the point is we in the ICU staff are almost always trying to avoid benzodiazepines due to their adverse effects um, on our patients. These include difficulty weaning from sedation and weaning from, from the vent. And it's also an additional risk of creating delirium with benzodiazepines. It's huge. Many, many people have a very familiar experience with giving too many benzodiazepines to their ICU patients, and they find that it's very, very hard to get them off this particular sedative. So now, all the benefits of propofol I told you about, now we're going to talk about the dangers of propofol, which is equally important, okay? So besides the fact with the celebrity, um, uh, the celebrity death that I talked about with Michael Jackson, but let's go deeper into that, okay? So the dangers of propofol. I'm going to reiterate again the need for patients on propofol to have ventilatory support prior to infusion. This is because of its ability to reduce respiratory drive. Michael Jackson. So now we are going to discuss the next severe complication of the drug, propofol infusion syndrome. It is rare, yet predominantly occurs in pediatric patients. So if you're a pediatric nurse or anesthesiologist, be a little bit more aware, which I'm sure you are, but as well as high dose propofol infused adult patients. So again, this usually applies to greater than 60 micrograms per kilogram per minute. That's why in many hospitals that I work with, they usually have IV guardrails that keep the dose to five to 50 micrograms per kilogram per minute. So if a patient is still fighting your sedation, then you can ask for a bolus of either a midazolam or a Presidex if they're available. If you don't want to take it straight from the tubing or from propofol that you're hanging itself. So I'm only going to mention this briefly, but please check with your hospital policies and procedures to make sure that your concentration and dose match the orders you're given. Because if you're giving a quadra dose uh, or a dose that's two, three, four times higher than the regular original dose, then you're not just giving two, three, four times higher. You're giving a more compounded amount than that. Okay, so I've been in hospitals where propofol was dose micrograms per minute instead of micrograms per kilogram per minute. So point is that not all hospitals use weight-based distribution to determine the dose. Now the next warning is that propofol's lipid-rich formulation make it easy for cross-contamination to occur. With all that fat, it makes it easy for bacteria to fester. So that's why many hospitals require propofol tubing to be changed every 12 hours. Now ICU nurses need to stay on top of this, Easier said than done, I know. But obviously you won't find a multi-use vial of propofol anywhere. There's always that one 100, maybe hopefully if you're lucky a little bit bigger, but you got that 100 um, milliliter bottle. But you definitely shouldn't reuse propofol or use the same bottles because of cross-contamination. Now speaking of fat, we're almost done here. The emulsion contained in propofol contains 0.1 gram of fat, 1.1 kilocalories for every meal. So imagine giving one liter of propofol every day. And one of the registered dietitians are not notified of this and the patient is on TPN and that patient is going to gain weight really fast or worse become excessively hyperlipidemic. So you will probably notice a lipid profile will be drawn on your patient at least every 72 hours. Now it wouldn't hurt to mention the results to your provider during rounds, so especially the failure to keep patients from prolonged hyperlipidemia caused by extended propofol infusion may lead to pancreatitis. And those of us that have had pancreatitis patients know that it involves a lot of pain management. So it also creates an opportunity for sepsis and which is a constant dread in the ICU. But if you've had a patient who wasn't sedated who've had pancreatitis, you know how often you have to give them pain medications. It is so painful. So interestingly, some people report propofol to cause green urine and skin due to the production of phenolic green chromophore. I haven't seen it yet. All right, so guys, I hope this was very useful to you, but 
Um, visit my website, www.nursehowie.com, where I have more detailed information on this topic, as well as a myriad of others related to critical care. If you're new to critical care, I will be offering limited enrollment to my new online class, The Nova Nurse, where you can prepare yourself to be the best, safest, and most competent nurse in your unit. Check it out. Um, now back to propofol infusion syndrome. Final touches, okay? Um, you thought you heard the last of PIS, didn't you? But let's remember the extended infusion doses of greater than 16 micrograms per kilogram per minute leads to PIS, propofol infusion syndrome. 60, all right? So deaths have been implicated in about five to seven adult patients, some of whom received more than 125 micrograms per kilogram per minute, and then one experienced cardiac arrest. High dose corticosteroids may have played a role, which is what we see a lot in COVID patients, but vasopressor agents also may play a role. So suspected pathologies seem to come from mitochondrial myopathy somewhere in the respiratory chain, but although the mechanism is unknown, rat studies show an uncoupling of oxidative phosphoryla phosphorylation as a result of an increase in proton permeability of the inner membrane. Um, it then develops into characteristic severe metabolic acidosis. Metabolic acidosis, metabolic acidosis. Look for that. Okay, rhabdomyolysis and fatal cardiovascular collapse. So it is important to know that all these cases involve patients receiving high dose propofol greater than 60 micrograms per kilogram per minute for longer than two days. So this effect may be mediated by nitric oxide. So although rare, children may be more susceptible to propofol infusion syndrome, but it may also have a genetic component in both adults and children. Similar to malignant hyperthermia, but not malignant hyperthermia. As mentioned before, hyperlipidemia, which is a result of free fatty acid metabolism failure, can be your early warning sign of an impending onset of PIS. My dog is snoring. <laughs> Apparently, he's not into this. Sorry, he's not into this lecture. Okay, we're almost done, guys. Keep your patients from being infused greater than 100 micrograms per kilogram per minute for an extended, an extended period of time. All right, these precautions are easier to follow in a well-funded teaching hospital in an affluent city, but nursing is not black and white, and you may find yourself working at a medical facility, talking to you people in Alaska, with less resources or other countries. <laughs> so if all of you have left is propofol and no other alternatives such as Presidex, check out that video that I made about Presidex as well, nor the midazolam and fentanyl combination, then that's that. The medical team may be forced to order pro protocol infusion uh, propofol infusion for an extended period of time and you may have a patient resistant to sedation requiring you to infuse at a dose higher than 100 micrograms per kilogram per minute that sucks but it's a possibility if this happens make sure you notify the icu physician intensivist and get it in writing as an order that you have to infuse at a dose higher than 60 micrograms per kilogram per minute and of course give them a notification that your mutual patient is heading in that direction of PIS and document it. Also mention that there are no other alternatives to propofol available to you. And furthermore, get the provider to increase laboratory markers that test for PIS by adding creatinine kinase, which we usually should always test, um, but definitely now because it's a definite indicator for rhabdomyolysis as well as triglyceride levels more frequent than every three days. So a little bit more. And then report arterial acid-based abnormalities because PIS is characterized by severe metabolic acidosis, metabolic acidosis, metabolic acidosis. You might have to prepare doses of sodium bicarbonate to reverse that. And the reason behind that is spotty at best. Thanks for watching. Here's a summary. All right, we did it. We went over the characteristics and formulation of propofol as well as indications for ICU illnesses. And according to our resources, propofol is remarkably safe and useful in traumatic brain injury, status epilepticus, which is refractory seizure, delirium tremens from withdrawal, status asthmaticus, as well as septic patients. However, no drug is perfect, and we still have to monitor our patients for allergic complications, hypertriglyceridemia, pancreatitis, and the dreaded propofol infusion syndrome. Okay, practice safe, everyone, and as usual, keep your patients a priority because they can't speak for themselves. They need modern nurses to advocate for them in their most vulnerable period. The reference I use the most for this presentation is listed as Merrick Paul, 2004, Propofol, Therapeutic Indications and Side Effects by Bentham Science Publishers, LTD. And if you're interested in more information, visit my website, www nursehowie.com in greater detail where more meta-analysis and reviews are utilized in evaluating propofol as well as other ICU and nursing related treatments. I also have an online class I will be offering called the Nova Nurse in the near future. 
There you will learn everything you need to know for critical care. And finally, don't forget to like and subscribe. Check out my critical care drips playlist. And for my next videos, I'll be delving into vasoactive medications such as dobutamine, dopamine, and milrinone. See you soon. Bye. Oh, I hope I got that all on, on take. <laughs>